The Russian invasion of Ukraine provided another situation calling for targeted export controls. These finely detailed initiatives help ensure U.S. military technology stays with allies and away from places like Russia. For his work over a career intending to targeted export controls, a Commerce Department career official is a finalist in this year's Service to America Medals program. Federal News Network's Eric White got the story from Matthew Borman. The mission of our bureau, uh, and of course in connection with other agencies and other parties, stakeholders, is to just essentially identify what are the key things that we need to keep from the parties who we don't want to get them. And in particular, Russia's you know unwarranted invasion of Ukraine has really required us to not only decide that among ourselves, what we need to restrict from Russia so it'll be impaired in its war-making efforts, but also get all of the other allies on board to do the same thing, because these restrictions will not be effective unless we get all the other supplier governments on board. So that's what we've engaged in with Russia since February of 2022. So is that mostly the job of of just going around to everybody who <laughs> will, will talk to you because there are your our allies uh and you know letting them know you know these are the specific things that we have to ban um from falling into Russia hands Essentially first step is for us to internally decide what we want to restrict and then how do we construct the regulatory uh framework to do that and then go to allies, starting you know with the key allies, the European Union, the Brits, the Japanese, and walking them through our thoughts, getting their thoughts, and then seeing uh, what they can do to to match ours essentially, or make sure that they're they're complementary. So, for example, coincidentally, about a week before the invasion happened, uh, but when we thought it was imminent, myself and one of our senior engineers went to Brussels, and we initially were going to be there for about two days. We thought discussing this with the European Commission staff and key member states, uh, we ended up being there a whole week because there was just a lot of detail to work through. You know, the con- the concept is simple, but as usual, the devil's in the detail, and we spent a lot of time being able to step through with them, answer their questions, have questions for them about how to, how, uh, how to align controls. Yeah, well, there's worse places to be stuck, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> That's true. <laughs> tell me a little bit about that process of identifying the uh, aspects of what you want to uh, ban from Russia. Uh, uh, do you consult uh, defense experts or uh, military experts? I imagine you have to uh, just because yeah. uh, <laughs> that stuff is complicated in its own realm. Can you just uh, tell me a little bit about that process? So we have quite a bit of expertise within our bureau. We have quite a few engineers, scientists. Uh, policy analysts, many of whom either worked at companies and or in some part of the Defense Department. But in addition to that, we certainly talked to people in the Defense Department, State Department, uh, Energy Department, and the intelligence community, and and look at open source information as well, and and trade data. You know, we, we again, have a pretty good idea of where Russia is dependent, heavily dependent upon foreign microelectronics, for example. And so that was a particular focus of ours. And then tell me about, you know, talking with those allies over in Brussels. Is there a counterpart for your bureau actually in most of the European Union? Do you find that or do they usually just have a trade czar that kind of (laughs) handles uh, a lot of their different parts that you deal with here uh, uh, stateside? Another complication is that, of course, the European Union is the administrative arm is the European Commission. And our direct counterpart is the director general for trade, DG Trade. But they, of course, need the consensus of all 27 member states. And all of the member states have some export control authority and personnel. Typically, it is either in the trade ministry or the foreign ministry. And so the way the European Commission staff manages, they get representatives from the key European member states, you know, Germany, France, uh, the Netherlands, uh, where they have the most high tech, if you will and the most sort of advanced export control systems because of the volume of trade they have. So that that was something that was a bit more for them to navigate, but we had to engage with both the commission level and the, the key member state levels. We're speaking with Matthew Borman. He's the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Strategic Trade and Technology Security within the Commerce Department's Bureau of Industry and Security. What have your results been? Anecdotally, I can say you're probably doing a pretty good job just from the pictures I've seen of uh, Russian soldiers having to equip themselves and create their own helmets and things like that. But uh, what are the what is the data that you all uh, analyze to make sure that, as you mentioned, 
that you can you can set sanctions, but you have to actually make sure that they're working and they're you're keeping these items out of Russian hands. And there's all sorts of data sets we look at to assess impact. Um, what we have seen is not surprisingly when we have uh, what we call our Global Export Control Coalition, the GEC, which is 39 countries, including the United States, with comparable controls on Russia. But of course, that means there's a lot of countries that don't have those controls. And so initially, not surprisingly, we found a spike in exports of the restricted items to those third countries and then third countries to Russia. So we've spent a lot of efforts, both at Commerce Department, Bureau of Industry and Security, but also with our agency partners and allies working with those third countries to get them to restrict the flow of the really key items that tend to be showing up in the Russian's weapon systems. And our assessment is that it is costing Russia quite a bit more and taking longer for them to try to get these components. And, and this is an ongoing effort, as you can imagine. The Russians have been trying to evade our strategic trade control since 1917. So they have a lot of experience in this area. And so it's an, on, it's an ongoing effort. This has been the main weapon of use from, from the U.S. government over the past you know, two or three decades. Uh, what can you tell me overall about uh, the U.S.'s ability now to control trade when, we have, uh, our, when our interests are uh, endangered uh, overseas, but we don't necessarily want to utilize any sort of military force or anything? Because like I said, this has been something that you know, we use not just on Russia, but on Iran, and, and the list goes on and on. The key thing is being able to get other supplier governments, allied supplier governments on board, because when we try to do these things unilaterally, it, they're going to have limited impact because, unfortunately, we don't have a monopoly on the high tech. You know, there's there's any number of other sources for high tech in the world. So it's just critical for us to get allies on board on these and then have, you know, the resources we need to do the analysis and then follow up with enforcement as needed to make sure that people understand if they don't comply with the rules. The the other big change over the last some years is we are using much more of our extraterritorial authority because basically every integrated circuit that's made in the world of significance is either based on U.S. software technology or produced with a U.S. tool. And so we've really been expanding the use of our foreign direct product rule to try to catch these items that are made, you know, U.S. intellectual property based, if you will, but manufactured outside the United States and try to make sure they're not going to Russia or other adversaries. You said that you had collaborated with a few of the defense entities. Do they do contract managers ever come to you uh, just to make sure that everything is the, the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed to make sure that, you know, hey, we were trying to make sure in this contract that it's stipulated you, you, you can't create this product and sell it off to one of Russia's allies or, you know, send it to Montenegro or anything like that. Uh, do you ever do consulting on that front? Oh, sure. So we, we have a full set of technical advisory committees that we meet court with quarterly, both to get input from them on technology developments, because it's very important for us to see what's, what's coming, what emerging tech is coming, um, and also make sure that they understand the rules and comply with them. And, and then we also have a very extensive outreach program. We do seminars around the country and sometimes abroad. In fact, we've been doing more of them abroad as well because of these extraterritorial controls to make sure that both U.S. and foreign parties understand the restrictions. And, you know, what we're talking about in our world mostly is so-called dual-use items, which are items that have very legitimate and widespread civilian applications, but also have significant military applications like advanced semiconductors, for example. All right. And then let's end here by putting the focus back on yourself. What prepares you to get into a role like this? I imagine having some international <laughs> business relations experience is key. But, um, you know, what else, you know, how long have you been in this role and how did you find yourself in it? So my, my background is I miss history major and master's and then a law degree. And then I started in, I started with a law firm in D.C., had a little bit of exposure to this, and then came into commerce in our legal office that's assigned to our bureau. So I, I had a good grounding in that. And then I've been the, in my current position uh, for about 20 years. I started uh, right at the beginning of 2001, sort of coincidentally, at the beginning of uh, the second Bush, Bush administration. My career is a career slot, but I report directly to uh, political appointees. So it's, it's uh, you know, some preparation, but a lot of it is you just, you just learn because we have so many experts 
that work in our bureau with other agencies, collaborating with industry. And industry is usually quite good about telling us what we need.